right. There it is. That's it. That, that fixed it. So, Chris, but now you took us. Um, how do we get back to the presentation? Um, Alt tab. How do we get back to the What do you know? Hey, five minutes.
Okay, we're going to get started. I just checked out my DVD from Ron. A couple more seconds. Okay, it's 7.30, we're going to get started. Welcome to the June meeting of the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. I'm Doug Holland, our president. And before we get started, um, like we always like to ask people to, if you're the first time you've been here, raise your hand, tell us your name, how you heard about the JSCAS, and what your interest is in astronomy. Anyone first time here? Anybody? There's no first timers. Oh my goodness, what did we do? It's okay. All right, fine, good enough. Have you been here before? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, fine. All right, so here's our agenda for this evening. And if you are online, you can send questions to the email address at the bottom questions or comments, jscslive at gmail.com, or you can put it in as a YouTube comment. And I assume, Chris, you know how to get those? I do. Are you doing it? Oh, yeah. yeah, Chris is filling in for Trevor tonight. So he's, uh, Chris, our Vice President Chris, is just taking the reins back there. He's got it all working, which is a miracle. So he will relay those questions. And if you have a question or comment in the audience, wait till one of our people with the microphone gets to you so that they can, uh, the people online can hear the jewels of wisdom that you have to impart upon us tonight. All righty, um, we have two ways for you to get uh, emails from us. You can either, okay, we have two kinds of emails. First is the meetings only one, and then the other one is the general email distribution. So you can either uh, Take a screenshot with your, your phone of these email addresses if you want to send them that way. You can, or out on the table, Ron's table where the DVD library is, there's a little tear off thing that has these two uh, email addresses on it. Send them an email, say I'd like to be on the distribution, and you'll get our emails. Since there's nobody here that's new, you guys probably are already on the email distribution. Okay, when you leave, it's a great mystery as to when the door out there is locked and when it's not locked. Um, but if it's locked, there's a green button right to the right side of the door. And um, so, so Alan, yeah, yeah, you can give me that, you can give us a bucket whenever you're ready, if you're done with it. Okay, anyway, if, if the, there's a green button to the right side of the door and you push the button and it unlocks the door and then you can open the door and go in and out. The door can't be open for less than, or more than 20 seconds, otherwise the alarm goes off which you don't want that to do. Why are you putting them in a hat? No, leave them in the bucket. <laughs> oh, no, I, no. Okay, fine. Yeah, bucket is fine. Thank you. Is that the magic hat so those guys will, yeah, okay. All right, anyway, so uh, don't leave the door open and the alarm goes off. Now, presenters. Where's Leslie? I was just talking to Leslie. There she is. Okay, so presenters, every time I stand up here and, and say this, nobody pays any attention to me. So pay attention this time, because every time you guys get up here, you, you don't do what I ask you to do. When you're, when you're presenting, you talk into this microphone and stand at the podium, or you can take one of these mics and turn it on, and you can walk around if you want to. But you got to talk into a microphone so the people online can hear you, right? First thing, which nobody pays any attention to. Second thing is a mouse pointer. When you, instead of using a green laser pointer, you use this mouse here, right? And this thing will, will point at things on your screen that you want people to see. We're doing that so the people online can see it as well as us. And then microphones for questions. If they're in the audience, someone has a question or comment, uh, please wait for the microphone to get you, and then you can ask your question or comment. To make this thing advance, you can either just hit enter, and it'll go forward, or you can hit in backspace to go back, or you can do page down to go forward and page up to go back. I think that's all you need to know. Okay. So um, you may recall throughout the history of the JSCAS, we've had a variety of people who have done our What's Up in the Sky segment. But last week, or last month at Mod Pizza, it was be known to me that Aaron was willing to do What's Up in the Sky for us for a little bit. And so Aaron is a student at UH Clear Lake, was the former UH Clear Lake um, astronomy club president 
and all around good guy. He's going to come down here and he's going to tell us what's up in the sky this month. Come on down, Aaron. Yes. This was my cover photo. I don't know why they did this. Um, so all times are local times, which is CST. Uh, it's going to be June 8th to July 14th. Uh, also, I wanted to mention thank you to everybody that came out and helped with the last star party at UHCO. Uh, they really appreciate that. So, uh, Mercury. Uh, it reached greatest elongation May 29th, so it's still uh, kind of visible in the morning if you get up really early. I usually go to the park over at Seabreeze. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Venus, um, its great, greatest elongation was June 4th, so now it's going to be transitioning into a crescent phase. Uh, and it'll still get brighter. Um, all the, I put the date and time over here in the bottom if you need to know that. Um, but on the 13th, uh, Venus is going to match up with the Beehive Cluster, which will be, usually is pretty good to see in the night sky. Um, this month, we have the summer solstice on June 21st. Um, and here's a fun one. I used to call this Apihelion. Uh, it's aphelion, and it's July 6th. Uh, it is when the Earth is furthest from the sun, which doesn't make sense because it gets really hot in July. <laughs> it, it's because of the tilt. Oh, no. um, Mars, Mars is still up. It's real small uh, in, in a telescope, even with good magnification. Um, it's kind of heading away for us for the next 26 months, but it's been heading away, so it won't be exactly 26 months. Uh, but on the 8th of July, it'll be close to Regulus in the sky. And on the summer solstice this month, uh, the 21st, Mars, Moon, and Venus will all be together. We're actually uh, going to throw some telescopes out over at UHCL, so if anybody wants to come and look at anything through a telescope, uh, get a hold of one of us from UHCL, and we'll give you details on it. June 21st. We're starting at 8.30. We'll just we'll be over by STEM in, in case anybody wants to look through some scopes. Jupiter's starting to come up in the morning. I've seen it. Um, it hasn't really cleared a lot of trees. Last time I saw it, a few weeks ago. Um, but on the 14th, it'll be close to the moon, so it'll be easy to spot if you don't know what these things are. And, and if you need, these are all made on Stellarium. Um, all these slides, it's a, it's a free open source planetarium. You can download onto your computer or your phone. Saturn. Uh, Saturn's starting to come up early in the morning. I actually saw it about... Um, 2.30 in the morning the other day. Um, and the rings are starting to get into that position where it's almost face on. You won't be able to see them very well. Um, but it was about three, three in the morning and it was pretty high up the sky, about 24 degrees when I looked. Uh, but it will also be close to the moon on June 9th. Uh, Uranus, be close to the moon on 615 if you have a hard time looking for that. Um, I haven't seen it since last season uh, when it was on the other side of the sun. Neptune, uh, I put that it'll be close to the moon on 611 and 78. It's kind of in that spot in the sky where it's hard to see things around here, um, but it's definitely still obtainable. Uh, and then here are some D DSOs. I don't know if you're doing any star parties or anything, uh, but N13 and M4 are always really good to show people their globular clusters. Uh, M57, the Ring Nebula, uh, is always a fun one. Um, the North American Nebula, uh, which is an emission nebula, I do believe. Uh, got a filter that's pretty good to see. 
and Alberio. It's a double star, but it's not a double star. It's a visual double star, I do believe. And then, obviously, we're coming into the Milky Way season. Uh, I've never seen the Milky Way that great out here. Uh, you probably have to go dark sky to see anything great. But I'm sure all these are obtainable or a lot. Uh, and this is a bonus. Um, if you can find Omega Centauri for the month, um, try to find it. Uh, it's in Centaurus. Uh, it's tonight. Its highest altitude will be 14 degrees and 36 minutes. Took this picture out in Smithville. Okay, little by little, we're recruiting people to participate. Doing that, Aaron. All right, so, so I guess I should have said in the beginning, tonight is a series of short talks by JSCAS members. So usually we have, most of the time we have like one speaker, you know, main speaker, but tonight we're going to have a series of short talks. This next one, I, David, told me that Leslie Eaton over here had this interesting talk about cowboys and astronomy. And I asked her to, if she would come and give this, this presentation to us. Leslie agreed to do that. And here she is. How cowboys navigate cow drive during the, using the stars. There she is. Uh, well, Joke. Yes, uh, the cowboys actually did use the stars to help navigate because remember, they, a long time ago, they had cattle drives because we were pushing cattle from Texas up north to feed folks. And they were having to move all these cattle. Well, at night, when they would try to navigate, it sometimes could be a little bit interesting, namely, you know, because the North Star isn't actually the brightest star in the sky, and a lot of people are surprised when they hear that. Um, but usually it's not too hard to spot even in a city, in the bright areas like what we have. And if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, it can really help orient you and help you find your way and it's located in the direction of actually true north versus magnetic north. And so it's, um, Polaris is so close to the celestial pole that it traces out a very, very tiny circle. It's not 100% stationary, but it makes a very tiny circle, so it almost appears stationary. And it's, it, that's what makes it a reliable way of finding um, north. And in fact, if you were out, if you were up at the North Pole and you were to look straight up, it would be straight over your head. And, but farther south, we can use it for orientation. One of the really interesting things is, as I said, you know, it's not the brightest star. In fact, it's actually like the 48th brightest star out there. But it can be somewhat easy to see. And that's one of the things that we like. But so, you know, how do we find the North Star? Well, one of the easiest ways is by over here by using the Big Dipper. You know, as most of us know, the North Star is at the very tip of the handle of the Little Dipper. And if you were to use these two stars here, on the Big Dipper, run them straight, that's a pretty good line to be able to find the North Star. And it's about five times the distance here, the total distance for it. And, you know, one of the really important things with the North Star was that cowboys could reliably use it, as I said, to be able to uh, travel and bring the cattle north, 
you know, because they could only move the cattle about 15 miles a day. If they did any more than that, it would actually wear on the cattle and they'd lose weight and not be in sellable condition. Um, I was rather surprised when I'd learned that. But, you know, as I said, once you're facing north, you know, Polaris, you're facing celestial north. So that helps. And one of the things that the um, that the cowboys would do is when they were traveling is they had a chuck wagon. You know, that's how they fed all the cowboys. And Cookie, also known as the chief cook, he's the guy that would drive that. Well, what's interesting is down here, if you look, that line right there is well, how he would, what he would hook up to his um, team of mules or oxen to be able to drag it. Because that was a pretty, actually a fairly heavy um, cart. And when he um, pulled it and they got to where they were bedding down for the night and he'd set up, cook a great meal. And after he pulled, put everything back up, he would take it and that handle there, he would orient to celestial north. Because then when they woke up in the morning and they couldn't see it, they still knew where celestial north was to be able to begin their journey. And I was getting also dealing with a cold, so my apologies for sniveling. You know, another easy way to locate the North Star is to know three constellations. You know, of course, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and Cassiopeia. And using this arrow kind of here from Cassiopeia, and again, here, from the Big Dipper, it's close enough that it can get you to where you can find the North Star. Um, it's also good because sometimes it'll get to where it's very, very low in the sky and difficult to find. And you can still use some of these other constellations. The, uh, in the months of February and March, Cassiopeia's particularly going to look kind of like a W up there. And the three stars that form that middle portion of the M and W, as I said, can be used to roughly locate the North Star, just follow it forward. Now, what's really interesting is with the um, Big Dippers, it actually rotates around that North Star during the seasons. And for us, you know, yeah, it's kind of interesting, but kids really find this fascinating. And that was one of the things that when I've spoken to the youngsters that they've found, oh, I didn't know that it changed direction. It spun. And the other thing is the North Star is also almost always halfway between Cassiopeia and the Big Dipper. And so that's another way to find it. Another note um, about the North Star is that it's a title that actually transfers to different stars over the years. Um, the Earth's axis of rotation wobbles and it, as it spins. And so this causes that celestial pole to actually wander a little bit. And sometimes there's no bright star near the celestial pole, as right now in the southern hemisphere. Uh, about 14,000 years ago, the celestial pole pointed towards Vega. And as it sweeps out in its slow circle, in about 12,000 more years, it'll point to Vega again. And that will actually become better for our pole. Um, now, Although stars, you know, have always been used, 
um, we've often used it. Cowboys also used the moon and as another way of um, finding their direction. In the Northern Hemisphere, when we have a crescent moon, if you run a line across those crescents, the horns down to the earth, that's going to give you a reasonable comedy approximation of south in the northern hemisphere. And um, <coughs> the point, um, excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, thank you. Also, the bright side of the moon, as you know, always is going to point towards the sun. So if the moon rises before the sun sets, the illuminated side will actually be facing west. And if it rises after midnight, it'll be facing east. So it's, um, that's another way that cowboys could get, be able to find some of their orientation. The best, most important thing was the trail boss and the cook kept really good notes as they, um, as they would travel, and they made you know more and more detailed maps. Um, they mapped the best routes. They mapped um, locations of things like water, um, the distance between rivers, creeks. And even also some of the terrain. And while it may not have been easy to read or write some of the stuff, they did know how to read the stars. And they read the land and the ranch hands that worked on the shifts um, also worked to help, you know, get these maps made to be able to get cattle to the market along the trail drive. And using these maps over and over again, they could get more and more accurate and be able to travel more quickly. So that's pretty much it. But uh, did anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. How is it they didn't have a compass? Because remember, the compass is going to magnetic north versus celestial north. Oh, so audience, what I would like to know is how come the cowboys didn't have a compass? And the reason they didn't have a compass is because the compass actually points to the magnetic north versus celestial north. And they wanted, they needed to travel to celestial north. Anyone else have questions? Well, that's it. And as I said, this is the type of speech that I'll be giving to some youngsters at various schools during the year when the speakers committee for the rodeo goes out and we do various types of speeches. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Don't ever say that we don't have a variety of topics here. Okay, so. Another one, Mark, I found out that Mark has been interested in, in near-Earth objects, near-Earth asteroids, something I'm very interested in, in planetary defense. So I asked Mark if he'd be willing to come and give us a presentation about this. And Mark is actually going to be our main speaker in August? September. September. So you can get a preview of Mark's speaking capability right here tonight. So here's Mark DeCellis. Hey there. Uh, yeah, I'm Mark. Um, so a little bit of me uh, about me on my background. Uh, I am not a an astronomy expert like some of the folks in this room, um, I, but I've been a member of the club for 20 something years with my wife, Susan. Um, I have a chemical engineering background, but I've had a long huge interest in space and astronomy and stuff like that. So a lot of interesting topics. Um, so this one, um, I, got, I got really interested with the DART mission, if y'all remember that, a if, if, uh, year ago, a few months ago, whenever it was. 
where you know they purposely ran a, a satellite, a, a, a space thing into um, into an asteroid, um, and it just made me wonder about um, what is this? <laughs> what, what about all these neos, uh, near Earth objects, and uh, planetary defense? So I just did a bunch of research. Um, same thing you could do. Um, but as I did it, I thought I would write things down and share it, and maybe it helps um, helps y'all want to go learn more about it. So anyway, so that's 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 the heritage of this. Um, so planetary defense. It's just an overview. This is going to be quick. We have a lot of slides to go through. So um, so why do we care? Um, well, space objects have always hit the Earth. Uh, space objects, they still impact the Earth and every other planet and every other thing in the solar system. Um, they can cause quite a range of consequences to Earth. Um, the thing that's changing is, you know, people have now developed the capability to find, observe, and catalog these. When you go back 100 years, that wasn't really available. Um, and now we're developing the capability to actually reduce the risk of the impact. And that's kind of what the DART mission was. It's a, it's a, a starting point for stuff like that. Um, and the other is, is there's now a growing awareness globally um, that it's a global risk. And you can see that because governments around the world are starting to um, actually fund ways to reduce risk and they're, de they're devoting resources to it. So that's, that's what's changed in the last um, 40 years, from what I can gather, that, um, that th this awareness has really become global. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, this is a very busy slide. There'll be a test on it at the end. Um, we, we're not going to go through every box. The, the awareness here is if, is if you look at the, if you look at the, 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 red, the red line, uh, to the left is international organizations, and to the right is U.S. organizations. The other is, is the brown boxes are policy groups. The green ones are more technical. So I don't want to cover every one of these, but I want you to be aware that there is, out of the U.N., is really what the heritage of, of some of this global planetary defense um, awareness is. Um, when you get to the U.S. side, there's all these different government agencies involved. Um, but I'd kind of like to stick to the technical things because um, you're going to hear, you'll, you'll hear things about this ATAP um, project, uh, the Planetary Defense uh, Data Systems, PDS. There's a small bodies node, very thing. Um, there's a C CNEOS, uh, the Near Earth Object Studies Group. And they share a lot of data internationally. In fact, when you look at the international effort, most of that international effort comes from U.S. Um, uh, efforts. But in the end, all these groups work together. In the U.S., it all comes down to this. Every two years now, there's an there's a asteroid impact scenario that is imagined, and, um, and they... they work through the the scenario and figure out how would they respond to it. So that's happening every two years now. I didn't know that. So um, it's interesting that that has gone to that level where they're actually looking to those things. But that's all. You, you guys can go and study this later on your own. But um, all these different organizations are involved. Um, so let's talk about some notable events. You'll, you'll, you guys all know these, I think, probably. Um, Y'all remember the Chelyabinsk airburst that happened? Um, that was in 2013. And um, big thing in Russia. Um, it had a ground damage, several kilometers, 1,500 injuries of people. It was an object that was 18 meters in, in size and in diameter. Um, they estimated, sorry, they estimated it was at this velocity. And it had this energy, 450 kilotons. That's the same thing they use for atom bombs. And as a reference, the um, Hiroshima bomb was 15 kilotons. Okay, so this, is, this was 30 times more energy than the Hiroshima bomb. 
And that's kind of what you can see on this page. The 1908 Tagunska, um, y'all may be familiar with that. It was this, this size, that size, had enormous energy. And it leveled 800, 800 square miles in Russia of trees. So pretty big impact. Of course, many of you have seen the meteor crater in Arizona. Um, it's a 40 meter one, this velocity, this much energy. And of course the impact crater. Um, but it had impacts for 40 kilometers around that crater when they look at it. And then of course the really biggie, 66 million years ago, um, it was a 10,000 meter asteroid. You can see the enormous energy and this is the one that hit near uh, in Mexico. And basically they link it with the extinction of the dinosaurs and a lot of other life you know, on earth. So this was a global event. But anyway, so those are some of the things that happen that we that we that we know of, right? Here's another thing I didn't realize, but here's um, all of the fireballs, which are all these air bursts, in, essentially, around the world for the last 35 years um, that have been recorded. Uh, and you can see, and here's the energy levels for all those. You can see they're all over the place. Uh, um, there is no one country that gets their share. <laughs> they, they don't get preference. This is a global thing. But um, this is the kind of stuff you can find if you, if you look at But this is the kind of stuff that's also being uh, recorded. Hey, Mark, I got a question for you. Yeah. Okay, what do they consider a fireball? Because, I mean, there's stuff, you, you know, when you go outside at night, you see bolides and all kinds of stuff. What, what, are they, what do they consider to be a, a fireball? Anything or what? I, I think it, it has to they in this case it has to do with the energy level. So I don't know what the I don't know what these energy levels uh, actually respond to or co correlate to as far as size. I don't I don't think it's like a it's not like a meteor shower where we see it's not that these are more um, events that are known that I mean they show up on instrumentation by some of the government sensors. Okay, I'm going to ask you something else. Okay, th that chart has negative energy on it. It does. Minus what? I think that's just the <laughs> scaling that they did. But I don't. It's it's oh, a, it's, it's a log, it's, scale. It a log scale. Yeah, good. good yeah, point. because You're if right, you that's what it is. Yeah, because if you remember this one, this was um, the uh, Chelyabinsk was 450 kilotons. Oh, he, he, he's, that's and what what marks the other mark said. Yeah, it's, it's a log scale, so negative. Yeah. That makes sense. It's okay, a log scale. It. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, this is some stuff I didn't. This is I didn't really understand how they classified uh, neos. So near Earth objects, um, there's near Earth comets, and there's near Earth asteroids, and this is what they. Um, this is how they bucket them. Um, the Q is how close it comes to the Earth. And the period is how many years this comet might have. We're not going to talk a lot about comets in this because there's just not that many, not many of them. Uh, but near-Earth asteroids um, is, is really where all the action is. And there's actually four classifications, and we can, you can look at all these numbers later, but basically this one, the asteroid is outside of the Earth's orbit. It gets close, but it doesn't actually cross the orbit. So it's, it's one of those. This one, it's close to the Earth's orbit, but it's inside. Did I get those backwards? Yeah, I got them backwards. But you can see they don't ever really cross the orbit, even though they get close. But they're classified as these kind. And these are named after an, ast an asteroid that was observed in each of those things. The ones that you got to pay attention to are these two, which um, are some that are uh, outside the Earth's orbit, but they cross it twice. Or they're inside the Earth's orbit, but they cross it twice. And so these are listed as potentially hazardous NEAs, near-Earth asteroids. But that's how the classification goes with these groups that are now following them. And um, just for Clarification, they also, these are all classified if they pass within 0.05 AU of the, of the Earth. And 0.05 AU is roughly 5 million miles or 20 times the Earth-Sun, uh, sorry, the Earth-Moon distance. Okay, that makes sense. 
But that's how they're classifying. They, they've, they've selected a, 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 a distance and they've selected um, the, other, the other aspects. Anyway, I didn't know that until I looked at it. So with this classification, they're looking. These are all the, the um, surveys that have gone on. We're not going to go through each of these. You'll see in the next things, these are the three biggies right now. Uh, these two are coming, uh, 2025, the Vera Rubin. It's a big telescope, but it will find uh, NEOs. And then the biggie is the 2027 NEO surveyor. It's, it's a satellite going to the Earth-Sun L1. Um, and you'll, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Um, so sizing NEOs, uh, that's the other thing is, you know, you're looking for very small things. Um, and depending on how they reflect light, they're either dim or they're bright, right? So how do you, how do you choose? How do you do that? Well, they have this equation that they use. Um, and it has to do with diameter, albedo, and absolute magnitude that they observe. The albedo is how reflective it is. Here's a chart. So this is the albedo, how reflective it is. And you can look at these magnitudes. This is how dim these objects are. I mean, they're in the magnitudes of 20s and 30. And 30. I mean, it's dim stuff. Um, and the albedos depend on the type of asteroid. And then they ca they, you can calculate the size. So like this size right here is 110 meters for a 22 and a half albedo of 0.15. So that's what this table is. Um, the thing is, though, when they when somebody observes an asteroid, just generally and randomly, um, how do they then decide if it's important or not? So what they do is they they uh, just at, off the start they assume the albedo is 0 0.14, and it's just a, uh, an average of the different kinds of asteroids. So they assume that they calculate through their calculation come up with a size, and if it's big and it's in, the, in, a, in a particularly un, unfavorable orbit, then they go get people to get more data. But that's how they do their first screening. And you can see here, this is, of all the asteroids found so far, this is the albedos, or sorry, the magnitudes that they are. So they're all, uh, they're dim. These are dim things. Of course, bigger ones are going to be less dim, and that's part of how they um, how they how they work it. But there's a lot of follow-up work for every one that's found. Keep going. So this is how fast how fast are we uh, finding neos uh, neos now? These are asteroids, and this is how many per year for the last uh, however many years 25, 20 years twenty five years, and you can see um, you know what the numbers are and it's 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 risen notably and you can see the different um places where they're doing it, the pan stars and catalina are the two biggies right now that are finding most of them but this is current up to recently so there's been about a thousand found this year with all these um, observatories okay and we're going to look more at this but here's more charts on how many just to give you a sense so this is how many total have been found in the past, or since, since they started. So we're up to about 32,000 is how many they found. Um, potentially hazardous ones of those, that, that th those two, two key types uh, is 2,300. So about 7% of everything that's been found are these potentially hazardous ones. Um, if you look at them by size, so zero to 30 meters, 30 to 100, 100 to 300, you can see the size and you can see how many are in each class. Okay. We'll talk more in a bit about how, what, which ones we really are worried about. Oops. Um, yeah, this is, uh, you know, which, this is, this is particularly the which ones. Uh, Oh, these are 140 meter ones. How many per year? And this is the big one. So you would expect the big ones are all found faster, sooner, 
And now we're no, we don't find very many big ones anymore because most of them have been found. So this is, this is not surprising when you think about it. Anyway, that kind of gives you a glimpse of, of, um, of what, what's out there. And just to kind of get even bigger, a bigger piece, um, the, question, the other question is how many are there? Right. So how many of these, how many of these kilometer size are there? We found 852. We're not finding very many of them. Well, how many should we find? Well, there there have been many statistical studies done. Oh, sorry. Um, and I'm not going to go through it because it's they're pretty um, pretty detailed. But they, they basically do all these statistical studies on asteroids and stuff like that. The bottom line is. Um, I'm going to jump over here real quick. For at the JPL Solar System Dynamics Group, they actually have cataloged 1.3 million asteroids. Okay, you go onto their website and you can find the particulars on every one of those. Two and a half percent of those are NEOs. And the same thing, they have cataloged 3,900 ca uh, comets. Three percent of those are are NEOs. But that kind of gives you a sense of what piece of the pie, because all these other asteroids are farther away from Earth. You know, they're out, in, out near Jupiter, they're wherever, but they're not crossing Earth. Um, so this chart gives you, using these statistical studies, um, for the large ones, the, the guess is we've we found 94 percent of them, or 140 meters, about not quite half. I didn't don't have a number here for these. I do have later uh, for all asteroids greater than 10 meters, seven percent, or sorry, 0 0.07 percent, because there's an estimated 45 million 10 meters and greater. A 10 meter one can be a problem, but um, not like these. Keep going. Um, close approach. This is just something I didn't realize, but every day almost there is a neo passing close to <laughs> close to Earth. <laughs> you can go on the um, on the CNEOS CNEOS um, website, and they publish which ones are closing like here's here's the table oh sorry uh there we go uh but they published the table of which one here's the next one is um here in what in a couple days and it's passing 0.02 au from earth and you can see the size and the magnitude it's a pretty big one it's almost 300 meters three or 400 meters big but it's you know it's passing close but um not one that 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 we're worrying about, and when you look at across the next year, this is what the table would be. So over over the next year, um, um, there are no objects um, 860 meters or bigger crossing Earth orbit. But if you go to the, this magnitude, which is 22 meter size, there's 83 passing. Uh, within uh, 0.05 of AU of the Earth in the next year. So they're going by all the time. We just, you know, they're just not a, they, they are known to not be a risk for impact. So let's switch gears a little bit. So what do we do about them? Uh, you know, we have those scenarios I mentioned that they do. They have a, every two years they do their exercise and stuff. Um, there's actually two scales that, that they use. It's called the Palermo scale and it's called the Torino scale. And the Palermo scale is mostly a technical comparison for technical, technical comparisons. The Palermo, the Torino is mostly for public communication. And, and you hear them both. Um, I don't think it's worth going through all this because you'll, you'll, you'll see that basically the agencies will then make alerts based on where something lands in these uh, tables. Um, as a for instance, on this, I was interested, 
Um, zero is basically what they call background hazard. It's just whatever, whatever background hazard definition would be. Um, there's been none of those. There are none of those right now. Right now, the, the biggest hazard one is Bennu. And some of you guys are maybe familiar with that because OSIRIS-REx, the mission that just collected part of it, is returning that part in September. Uh, but it's actually the one that has the highest rating in this system. It has a 0.057% chance of Earth impact in, between, in these years. But that's how they're rating this one. Anyway, so you can go and look at all this stuff and and uh, try and figure out which ones are which. But uh, but that's how they that's how they're doing ratings. And based on these ratings is when they do public alerts or something like that. So this is the UN group. So for instance, this is when this is their decision thresholds. They will give a warning if there's a one percent chance probability of impact for something that's 10 meters or larger. Um, they get serious if there's something in, within 20 years, 10% chance of impact, that's 20 meters. And then mission option planning, uh, 50 years, could be within the 50 years, 1%, 50 meters. Mission option planning is what can humanity do to, to deflect this thing? or to get it out of the way. So th this, is, this is when you would start doing dart missions to it and stuff like that, trying to deflect it, when you have time to do something. And then this is um, every year, what is this, the NSTC, which is the National Something Technical Council, they issue their, uh, sorry, their uh, national preparedness strategy for action and action plan for near earth object research and planetary defense. So your, your government does that every year to, um, to basically establish here's, here's what we're looking at, here's the goals, here's the resources we're gonna give it, and, uh, and they do that. Here's the table they've put together. Um, and what's interesting here is, it, is they give the, the different asteroid sides. The key one is 140. Um, there was a congressional directive in 2005 that NASA was, was asked to find and characterize 90% of all NEOs 140 meters and larger. The reason is, if you look at the table, um, they don't happen very often, but they are enormously devastating. So if the Earth got hit by one this big, it's it's extre extremely devastating. So that's the that's the current congressional mandate is to find everything that large basically and and bigger. Now something fifty meters is still important, and I think what you see is that even though they're only even though they're only mandated for this, they're fi they find so many across the whole range. And then um, down here is. Um, this is kind of showing what trajectory we are on as far as finding the percentage of the 140 meter ones. Uh, if we did nothing, it would be on this line. We would be 60% of them by 2040. With the Vera Rubin, it jumps it up to here. But with that NEOS um, um, satellite, it, it, that's the game changer for finding these. So that, that's a really important mission that, got, that NASA has funded. Um, anyway, so that's all, I think that's all I have. And then the last page is a lot of uh, information sources. If you wanna go and look at, look at the YouTube of this and you can look at these. Okay, so I got a question. I think Jim's got one. Okay, so on that chart there, yeah. are you 2024 next year you're telling me that we're somewhere between 50, 40 and 50 percent at this moment is that correct correct okay for 140 meter and larger okay what sort of wavelength of light is the neo wise mission going to be using to find them 
I knew somebody was going to ask me that. I don't know. I didn't take the time to study it because it's to study that or the Vera Rubin. I don't. The, the reason why I'm asking is it seems to me that they should be using IR I in think, order to uh, find these yes. things. Uh, because I, if it's not visible, visible light, it's going to show up thermally regardless how big it is. Yes. So I'll, I'll rephrase that. It is IR. I don't know what wavelengths. Yes. Good, 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 good point, Jim. Um, David may be able to, I just wanted to add to your talk. Um, our sister astronomy group in Fort Bend has a team that actually finds uh, asteroids and there's a procedure for it, but they've, they have found 330 hmm? plus, I believe. Is that right, David? That they get the name after that, but and they submit it. There's an organization in Europe that they have to submit it to, but, and they're not using the 36 inch out there either to do it. Uh, it's remarkable. Okay. All right. I think we're good. Thanks. Hope, yeah. Hope that was useful. Okay, variety, yes. Okay, almost. Okay, so this is Hart here. Oh, Dr. Hart Gillespie right here. So if you guys have been around here for the last many months, uh, Hart's been kind of hanging around with us at our Astronomical Society meetings and going to Mod Pizza with us, and we've gotten to know him a little bit. And uh, last time, last month, we were, at, we were at Mod Pizza, and I asked Hart, you know about what he's doing and i found out that he is getting ready to leave us and he's going to go work at jpl so yes so hard as a postdoc which i kind of knew that and he was one of our presenter a few months ago you guys may remember real good presentation he's been working here at lpi as a postdoc he's getting ready to go work at jpl and the mars reconnaissance orbiter right mission which is really cool so I asked him, I said, will you come here and talk to us and tell us about what you've been doing here and what you're going to be doing at JPL? And he graciously agreed. And I think there was something about he, he was going to be gone by now, but he's a good guy. He decided he'd stay long enough to come and tell us about what he's up to. So uh, there he is. And he's a really, really, I really appreciate you doing this because this is really cool what you're doing. So, and sometimes, you know, when we come to these club meetings, we don't get to know each other all that much, but you know, he's uh, he's kind of interesting guy. So I thought you guys might want to hear about what he's up to. So, Hart Gillespie. Thanks for inviting me to talk to you all, Doug. Uh, as you might imagine, what with me uh, packing to leave, uh, this is actually my last day at LPI. Uh, as of a few hours ago, I am no longer an LPI employee. So I will be moving on. That's fine. <laughs> I'll be moving on to JPL. Uh, and so tonight I'll be trying to tell you all what it is that I do in uh, as few words as makes sense, as well as some results that I have found and am hoping to find. My job here at LPI can be summarized in one sentence to maximize the scientific return of tears. That was the task that I was given by my advisor here, Dr. Herman Martinez. Now, tears uh, is the thermal infrared sensor, not spectrometer. I made a mistake there. The thermal infrared, cross that out, sensor uh, aboard the Perseverance rover on Mars. Uh, the TIERS instrument gives us observations of surface temperature and temperature nominally at about 40 meters above the surface with uh, the upward pointing sensor actually observing a wide range of uh, altitudes in the atmosphere. Now, also on board the Perseverance rover shown here is the air temperature sensor. 
which gives us temperature at around 1.4 meters or so. So I was thinking before um, working here and in the early phases of me working here, um, and now I'll pose this question to you as well, how do you maximize the scientific return of tears? There are a lot of ways to do this. But one way to do this is to leverage my prior experience with the instrument that I am going to be working with in my postdoc at JPL, which is the Mars Climate Sounder, which conveniently observes temperature in much of the rest of the Martian atmosphere. So I looked at data from the Mars Climate Sounder. What I'm showing you here is information about uh, dust in the Martian atmosphere. And I'm showing you this at both uh, 3 a.m. local time on the left and 3 p.m. local time on the right early on uh, in the Perseverance mission. I'm showing you this because one of my collaborators, Mike Smith from NASA Goddard, showed that... Um, over the course of observations from Perseverance, we see that typically there's more dust in the Martian atmosphere during the day as compared to during the night. But if you look at these plots, which I've scaled uh, so that the, uh, the scale bars match, these are uh, altitude versus dust opacity plots, um, they actually turn out to be fairly similar amounts of dust, even perhaps more dust at 3 a.m. to my eyes. Now, MCS cannot see too close to the surface, particularly in the dust field. You see um, we've got an altitude of five kilometers here at the bottom of both of these plots, and MCS is cutting off at maybe seven or eight kilometers. So what's going on in those lowest kilometers? How much dust is there down there? The Perseverance observations telling us that there's more dust during the day than at night give us not only some idea of how much dust is down here, but some idea of how well mixed that dust is down there. And in particular, what's exciting about this is we might be able to show that at one of these two times, at least, perhaps at 3 a.m., the dust is not well mixed in the lowest seven kilometers or so of the Martian atmosphere. That would be a new result. That's not something that we currently have the capability to assess with data um, in, in too many concrete ways. We have to infer it by, say, the use of multiple observation systems, as I'm proposing here. My future job at JPL is a little bit more vague, um, but one key idea for me at JPL will be to identify transport pathways for dust and water ice during regional dust storms using Mars Climate Sounder data. Now, the Mars Climate Sounder aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter um, is an instrument that observes temperature, dust, and water ice in the Martian atmosphere by looking at the edge of Mars, as seen from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, because it's aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a polar orbiter, it gets observations of these fields at 3 a.m. and 3 p.m. local time, pretty much everywhere on Mars. Uh, from near the surface to about 80 kilometers above the surface. This observation geometry of MCS means that it has good vertical resolution throughout the atmosphere, but it also means that the instrument's observations are obstructed by aerosols, such as in regional dust storms. Hence, knowing um, about the transport of dust could be useful to augment MCS observations. And you can identify these transport pathways by looking at Mars global climate models and particle tracking, which I did in my dissertation. Yes, 
Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yes. When you say it's a polar orbiter, does its orientation in the z-axis change to the orbit, uh, to, to the planet? Um, Stay in the same relative position as you're showing in this picture as it goes around the planet. What I want you to imagine here is uh, if you were to grab the satellite and that arrow, you could rotate it around the center of Mars, as, as you see on the right side here. So the, the satellite and the observing geometry would stay in the plane of the, uh, the PowerPoint slide. So why are you limited to only 3 a.m. and 3 p.m.? The reason is because MRO is sun synchronous. The orbit was set up in such a way that it's, um, that it's passing over the same portions of Mars relative to the sun. So the sun is always in the, the same direction relative to MRO. Thank you. Good question. So uh, this particle tracking is something that I did as part of my graduate work at Penn State. Here, what I'm looking at is dust transport near the start of the Mars Year 34 global dust storm, as estimated by a data set that I produced uh, in collaboration with my advisor and so many other people at Penn State called the Ensemble Mars Atmosphere Reanalysis System. You can see the path of the dust in a latitude and longitude cross section. Uh, the middle particles path is shown in the black. And on the right, you can see a cross-section of height and latitude for that particle path. Again, in the black, it goes all over the place. Um, you can also see the paths of other particles shown a little more indirectly. You can see where there's particle start in the blue. This is roughly the source region of the Mars Year 34 global dust storm in its early phases. You can see that the particles go to the magenta locations after one day and the red locations after five days. And what I found interesting about this plot when I made it back in grad school was that you can see just based on um, the winds in EMARS that these particles travel all the way around Mars in some cases after just five days demonstrating that this source indeed is capable of producing a planet encircling um, dust cloud. I think so too. I'd like to thank you all for your time and thank you all for having me in uh, the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. Thank you. Can you go back to your graph that shows the comparison of day and night? Yes. That one right there. Yeah. And you said that you think that there is a significant increase in the 3 a.m. versus the 3 p.m. I think the 3 a.m. looks a little bit larger to my eye. Not by too much. So I guess I don't understand what your x-axis actually means. When I say ah. kilometer to the negative one, that to me indicates a size. Not a very intuitive yeah. measurement of dust, I agree. Um, so what this means is if you, if you take one over this value in, on the x-axis, that is the depth of a dust layer with that amount of dust in it throughout the depth of the dust layer at all those different heights that you would need in order to cut down the amount of solar radiation passing through that dust layer from one, all the dust that's coming in at the top of the layer to a factor of one over E at the bottom of the layer. 
I think the thing that jumps out to me is there appears to be a diurnal migration of your dust. Just a little bit, yes. It, it does look like the dust rises a bit during the day and sinks a bit at night. And that, um, that comports with things I've seen in EMARS, which makes total sense. Of yeah, course. This, that makes a lot of sense. Heat rises, you get more insulation during the day versus at night and heat cooling because of the same. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's, that's exactly the mechanism. Thank you. Hello. I'm just curious why there's a zigzag or an S shape at all. In what this plot? Yeah. Obviously, there's something going on at 20 kilometers and something going on at 15. I agree that that is curious. And as for a precise reason, I don't have one for you today. Um, one possibility is that the way the Martian circulation works is that uh, you have air rising uh, in the equatorial region around this time, and then it will spread poleward once it reaches roughly a certain altitude. I don't know exactly what that altitude is off the top of my head at this particular time in this particular place, but uh, 20 kilometers seems like a reasonable guess um, based on this plot. As a possibility. So does Mars have an equivalent to Earth's thermosphere, ionosphere, stratosphere, mesosphere? It has equivalents to those, yes. Do they match up with your different altitude gradients? They do not. So um, depending on who you ask, you'll get some different answers for which spheres there are and exactly where they are in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, everyone agrees that Mars has a troposphere, and everyone agrees that Mars has a thermosphere. And it's pretty reasonably um, safe to say that the thermosphere starts at maybe 80 to 100 kilometers or so, about the upper limit of MCS observations. Um, a lot of people will say there is a stratosphere on Mars and that there is no mesosphere. Um, I would say that the stratosphere, in, in my personal opinion, the stratosphere is, is strictly polar phenomenon. So all of this is the troposphere, in my view. There are no appreciable winds on Mars because there's low atmospheric pressure, right? There, the winds are not, um, do not have a lot of force. Um, but the winds are quite strong on Mars. Um, Mars has a stronger jet stream than Earth, for instance. So, for instance, you can have winds in the jet stream on the order of 350 miles per hour, um, which is quite a bit more than what you can find on Earth. But those winds don't push as hard as the earthly winds do. Uh, just a comment, we do know that there are dust storms on Mars, so the winds are obviously strong enough to kick up a lot of dust. Yes, and the dust, um, in a lot of those dust storms, you can have particles of two, sometimes three and four microns be advected into the free atmosphere, you know, these sorts of altitudes that you see here. And sometimes in the large dust storms, you can have even larger particles enter the atmosphere. When you were just talking about uh, the, uh, the scale you had there, it sounded a whole lot like opacity, especially when you described it, I guess, an exponential scale. Is it just a coincidence or is there any distinction there? Or what, what's the story? That's no coincidence because it is opacity. Uh, yes, um, ice actually also has a non-negligible opacity at this particular time. Um, I've made those plots, and as it happens, the ice cloud is basically in the same place as the dust cloud, which is not something that I'm used to seeing.
Do you ever get the opportunity to do any observations of the atmosphere over Olympus Mons? And does that change your graphs presented on here? Uh, we do have the opportunity to see the atmosphere above Olympus Mons. Uh, I have never taken specific effort to look at the atmosphere above Olympus Mons and to see how the atmosphere above Olympus Mons or the peaks of the other large Tharsis volcanoes, you know, the, the very, very highest points uh, on Mars is different from the atmosphere over other places. But the atmosphere of Olympus Mons must be quite different than this because Olympus Mons goes up to like here. You, you just cut off the bottom of the plot at least. Um, and there's probably more differences yet than just that. And I was bringing it up was because you typically have almost permanent ice clouds above those things. And that, as a consequence, your opacity would change and that might change your dust transport or your water transport there. It would, yes, for sure. Thank you all. All right, well, good luck, Hart. We know you're gonna do great. Hey, okay, Ron, would you like to tell us about the DVD library? Do you have, do you have a microphone over there? It's coming your way. Uh, thank you. Um, you'll see the chart out here that uh, it's all our DVD collections. I think there's over 200 now. So, and you'll see they're coded. There's a legend on top. About 80% of them are by Astronomy Magazine. Um, there it's the infinite cosmos or it'll be marked on the chart for um i c but anyway um you're more than you know please feel free to take them out it's our library if if it's marked in black that means somebody kept it <laughs> but if it's red then it's out for right now anyway thank you Ron. Okay, so the meeting after the meeting, when we get done here, um, you come out here, we're gonna go to Mod Pete's afterwards. Um, you come out here to Bay Area Boulevard, shoot up Middlebrook North, go left on Clear Lake City Boulevard, cross El Dorado and right from the HEB, there's Mod Pizza. And we're gonna get together there and talk about more astronomy topics and other things. So everyone's welcome to come to that. All right, we're going to take a short 10-minute break, and you guys can all go out and get yourselves a DVD at Ron's DVD library. I have mine here. See? See? Extreme Energy. That's what mine is going to be for this month, but he's got them out there. We'll break for 10 minutes and then get back together and do the second half of our meeting.
Okay, we're going to get started. So, let's see. Normally, I was going to have Jerry go next, but there's a bunch of people outside that haven't come in yet. I'm thinking I may do things out of order because Jerry's got a really cool talk, so I'm not going to, I don't want to mess up his audience. So, let me do something a little different here. This is Jerry. Just kind of ignore all this stuff for a minute, okay? That's Jerry's talk. All right. I'm going to do mine real quick so I can get everybody together. Okay, wind, X-bar, and small telescopes. Okay, so we went out to the X-bar ranch in uh, April, which I told you guys about. There's five of us, the, the Brave Five. And when we were out there, there was lots of wind. So I had two kinds of telescopes with me. I had a big telescope that was susceptible to wind and a little telescope that was not susceptible to wind. And so sometimes it's good to have a small telescope because, you know, sometimes they're better in some situations. So I'm going to show you some things you can do with a small telescope, which is actually just a camera lens in this case. Which I couldn't do with my big telescope. This is a picture of this is a monkey head nebula down here, NGC 2175, and the pointer's kind of acting up. And this is a jellyfish nebula up here in the middle, uh, IC443. And then down here in the lower right is M35, the soccer ball cluster. So, you know, sometimes when you take a wide field shot of this, normally we see these close up in a telescope, but it's kind of interesting to see that they're actually all right there in the same part of the sky. So that's those three. Another thing you can do, there's the, the Virgo galaxy cluster. So normally when we look at this with a telescope, we may look at just one of these individual galaxies. But if you zoom way out with a wide field shot, you can see the whole uh, big part of the galaxy cluster. So this particular shot shows the Messier galaxies in this region here, the Virgo galaxy cluster. And then when you add the NGC and ICs, there's so many in that area that you can't even see the galaxies anymore. There's so many of them. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them there. And uh, that's why they call it the Virgo Galaxy Cluster. There's so much. Yeah, cool, huh? And then my last one I was going to show you is, uh, this is the, oh, who can name this one? Cat's Paw Nebula, Nebula NGC 6334. And this one over here has a whole bunch of different names. It's uh, One of the names is War and Peace Nebula, which is NGC 6357. But interestingly enough, with a wide field shot, they are actually sitting right next to each other, which is kind of cool. And then another thing I like about this shot is when you get when you do one of these, you can look down here. And as, as you start looking towards the middle of the Milky Way, you see this density of dust and gas and stars. And, and the closer you get to the middle of our our Milky Way and the plane of Milky Way, the more dense the stars and, and uh, gas, gas and dust get. So that's that. And I think everybody's come back in now. So that's my web page. You want to look at all the things that I do like that. Post my web page. Now I'm going to back up and let Jerry do his talk because I wanted to have everybody in here before he started. So sorry if I'm giving it all away for you, Jerry. Okay, so Jerry... Jerry, by the way, Jerry and I, we're, we're both have taken an interest in radio astronomy recently, so we're going to join the SARA, which is a Society for Amateur Radio Astronomers, and uh, we're doing that. But Jerry's going to talk to us about Vera Ruba lessons from galactic rotation observations. Let's welcome Jerry. Uh, I'll be fine. Sounds good. All right. Okay, so uh, the image that you see there uh, is from uh, an astronomy picture of the day about two months ago. So I'm sure most people know about astronomy picture of the day, but if you don't, you can sign up to get a picture to your cell phone or your computer every day with a little bit of explanation to it. Uh, and you can actually go to the website and see all the previous ones too. Um, so this one kind of uh, caught my interest was a really striking galaxy that we're seeing not quite edge on, but at, at an angle <clears throat> with a bright star uh, in, in the foreground and a, another galaxy up at the upper right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, it has a catalog number, which is, uh, you see there, UGC 2885, but it also had a name called Rubens uh, Galaxy. And I had a little familiarity with Vera Rubin, and I kind of vaguely knew that she had something to do with uh, the rotation of galaxies, which has something to do with dark matter, but I wanted to find out a little bit more about it, and that's what I'm going to share with you uh, today. So when I got into this, um, I went a several different directions. Uh, 
So number one, who was Vera Rubin? I was kind of interested in finding out a little more about her life and what she did. <clears throat> and then uh, that kind of led to, well, um, where did she get her training and how, how was she connected with the whole um, community of astronomy and physics? And then what were her contribute, contributions to physics and astronomy? And this has a lot to do with the rotation of galaxies and the, the uh, idea that there is dark matter. And then um, looking at that kind of got me into the idea about, well, what about uh, changing roles and opportunities for women in astronomy and actually by extension in physics, because I certainly had the experience as a physics graduate student back in the 1970s that there weren't very many women in physics, either faculty or uh, students. I can remember one graduate student uh, in my group who didn't stay. Uh, and I can't remember any female faculty. We did get one uh, who came a little bit later, but uh, this was in uh, physics. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't that connected with the astronomy uh, department there. So who is Vera Rubin? Uh, she was born in Philadelphia, and her family moved to Washington uh, when she was about 10, and uh, she uh, shared a bedroom with her sister, and she had to vie with her sister for the, the, the location next to the window, but she uh, was able to look at the stars through the window, and she got interested in the stars through that. Her father was an engineer. A little later on, she, along with him, built a crude telescope, and she started uh, looking at meteors with that. Um, at least that's the story. Uh, so she did uh, eventually enroll in uh, Vassar College, and she graduated in 1948 with a degree in astronomy. Uh, and actually, she was the only one with a degree in astronomy that year. Um, she, uh, how did she get to Cornell? So she got married to a graduate student at Cornell, and so she ended up at Cornell, and she enrolled in a master's program and uh, found a really uh, stellar mentor there, Martha Starr Carpenter. And uh, Martha Carpenter was interested in uh, galactic motions, and so that's how she got started looking at the motion of galaxies. There were also a number of other people of, of, of professors there whose names you probably recognize, Philip Morrison, Hans Betty, and Richard Feynman that uh, she was able to study under. So that was really a, a stellar opportunity, I think, for her. So um, she um, wanted to do a PhD. And so she started out at Georgetown University, which was the only university in the Washington area. I think her husband had she and her husband had moved to Washington at that point, that offered a degree in astronomy. But um, uh, she uh, was advised to go see George Gamow, who was at uh, George Washington University. And uh, as you probably know, he was a physicist who came from Russia, very famous guy. Um, and he took her on as a graduate student and she worked on fluctuations in the space distribution of the galaxies. That was the title of her dissertation. Now, there's a bit of a story with that in terms of uh, what it was like for women in this field at that time. The building that George Gamow's office was in, it was a Catholic university, George Washington University at that time, and uh, women weren't allowed in that building, so she had to meet with her professor outside somewhere else. <laughs> Um, so she got her degree, and the next 10 years, she worked at George Washington University in different roles. She started out kind of as, as people do, as a research associate, and then a lecturer, and then eventually got to assistant professor. During that time, she had a really interesting collaboration with uh, Jeffrey and Martha, uh, Margaret uh, Burbage. Um, and she was able to make some of the first galactic rotation observations. And some of these were made at McDonald Observatory, interestingly enough. Um, she also uh, had the opportunity to go to the Palomar Observatory, which was pretty new at that time. And there's another interesting story about that. Uh, when they uh, designed and built this, uh, there was no women's restroom at Palomar. 
So uh, she simply took one over and uh, made it into a women's restroom. So she was really quite assertive in, in getting her role as a, as a, a colleague and an astronomer. Um, in 1965, she joined what was then called the Carnegie Institution of Washington. And she was uh, in the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism. It's kind of an interesting name. And that department started out around the turn of the 1900s uh, to do exactly what it says. But it evolved into uh, a group that supported a lot of different areas of physics, astronomy, and other types of sciences, geosciences, for example. Uh, this institution now is called the Carnegie Institution of Science, or just Carnegie Science, and this department has merged with the geophysics department to, to form what's called the Earth and Planets Department. So again, they are continuing to support a wide range of uh, science in, in that uh, area, physical science. Uh, and if you go to their website, they have a neat timeline that shows all of the important discoveries that this institution has funded and supported. Uh, so in this, uh, at this time, he um, was developing a collaboration with John Ford, who would continue to be a collaborator throughout most of her career. John Ford was an instrument maker, and he was responsible for creating uh, imaging tubes. And these imaging tubes amplified images so that you could get spectroscopy of much fainter objects and including much fainter galaxies. And so it allowed the, the really the um, spectroscopy of galaxies, which was what was needed in order to make these uh, rotation velocity measurements. Um, the picture there um, shows her at the Lick Observatory actually, and, and what she's looking at there is one of these John Ford imaging tubes. Um, so, um, there is a, a discovery that was published uh, called the Rubin Ford effect. And it has to do with what's called large scale streaming, which, which really means that there is an anisotropy in the way that galaxies move. Uh, there's something called the Hubble flow, which is how galaxies move with the expansion of the universe. But when they move uh, in a way that's not exactly uh, like that, then uh, that's called large scale streaming. And it has to do with anisotropies uh, and also with the uh, peculiar motion of galaxies. Um, so that wasn't very well accepted at the time. It was kind of controversial. And so they went back to looking at, ga at the rotation of galaxies and that turned out to be a really much more fertile and better accepted uh, uh, field of uh, study. And that's what actually paved the road to the idea of dark matter. Uh, the, the idea of dark matter actually been proposed much earlier by Fritz um, Zwicky um, back in the 1930s. And that was based on his observations of uh, the, the uh, clustering of, of galaxies. Uh, so he was the one who coined the word, but um, Vera Rubin was really responsible for providing a lot of this basis for the acceptance of this as something, something real. Okay, so she was recognized uh, a lot of different ways. So she had a really stellar career. And you can see there some of, I won't read all of them, but uh, the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society was the second woman only after Carolyn Herschel to get that. And you can see the amount of time that elapsed. <laughs> um, the other thing which we've already heard about is that the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope has been renamed the, by the Vera Rubin Observatory. Uh, also, just at the bottom there, there's a nebula in Star Trek named after her. <laughs> uh, books, if you wanna read more about her, the two books, uh, the one by um, uh, the uh, two Mitten authors there, uh, Vera Rubin, A Life, is a pretty good book. Uh, she has a book herself about the, some of her work called Bright Galaxies, Dark Matters. And then on the bottom there, uh, a couple of books that are really for, for kids, which are, are really nice if you want kids to get interested in astronomy and physics. Uh, the one up in the upper uh, right is basically a book she edited on a, on a, 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 a conference 
on the large scale motion in the universe. And I've found that that's actually still uh, available, uh, but probably is quite technical. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to know a little bit more about how she fit in. And there are these things called academic trees. And you can find them online. There's an astronomy tree, there's a physics tree, and there's a neuro tree. And there's others as well. These are, those are the ones I'm familiar with. The reason I'm familiar with the neuro tree is because I fit into that one, but I'm kind of an odd duck in that I cross over to the physics tree. So <laughs> um, basically what it is, is uh, you have um, academicians, scientists, and then below them, you have people they trained in some way or other. Usually it's a postdoc or a graduate student, uh, but as you get back in earlier times, it becomes a little looser in exactly how those connections uh, uh, occurred. But I've put the time scales there, and you can you probably recognize some of these names uh, if you can see them. It's a little bit <laughs> small. But you can see as we get to into the 1900s there, uh, we get down to Martha Starr Carpenter um, and then uh, uh, eventually to Vera Rubin. And uh, her active career, you see there, was, was pretty long from 1948 to 2016, when she, she died in 2016. Uh, she continued her career pretty actively until almost the time that she died. Um, and then under her, there, there was only one person under her, but that, that really is not a good representation because at the Carnegie Institution, she mentored many, many people, including, uh, according to one, uh, at least up to 80 uh, different uh, uh, people who were working with her, many of them women. So Sandra uh, Farber, Faber, uh, who is at uh, UC Santa Cruz, was one of those people who worked with her at the Carnegie Institution. She didn't really, was in a position to train a person as a graduate student for a PhD, but uh, she was in a position to train people who had, um, I guess, uh, postdoctoral fellowships there, that kind of thing. So I amplified this a little bit with the pictures. As you can see, uh, there's uh, Martha Starr Carpenter on the left. Uh, and uh, Vera Rubin in the middle. Uh, on the right is a picture of her with her daughter who also became an astronomer. Um, and then there's um, Sandra Faber. The reason I put her and, and her extensive list of trainees in, uh, the ones that I've outlined in red were all women. So you can see how the opportunities for women in this field are expanding and expanding. I won't say that uh, gender discrimination is gone, but I think the opportunities for women uh, in physics and astronomy are much better these days than they used to be, and without so much trauma as people like Vera Ruin had. All right, so I want to spend just a couple of slides with the science, and I don't have to say too much because if you were at the meeting last time, Dr. Clavenson went into this in, in quite a bit of detail, but the, for this slide just summarizes what is the observational evidence for dark matter. Number one, it's the rotation curves of galaxies, and I'll say a little bit more about that. The second is velocity dispersions, which is basically the um, velocities of stars in a system, such as an elliptical galaxy or a globular galaxy, or um, that uh, is about the mean. So the question is, if these velocities are high, how come it doesn't disperse? And the answer is gravity. <laughs> um, the third is the measurements of uh, galaxy clusters. And basically there is a scatter in the radial velocities of the component galaxy, sort of the same thing as the velocity dispersion idea. There's also what's called pressure from X-ray energy spectrum. So there's hot gas between galaxies, and this, this gas has high, molecules have high velocities. And if there's not something keeping them there, they're also going to disperse. And then the final thing is galaxy, uh, sorry, gravitational lensing by galaxy clusters. So you can kind of measure what a mass is by how a, gra a gravitational lens looks. And um, the, all of these three things require more mass than you can see in, in terms of visible um, material, stars, uh, uh, hot gas, or even gas that's absorbing light from behind. 
So that's really the basis for the idea of dark matter. There has to be something which has a gravitational effect that we don't see. All right, so the next slide, I, I wanted to get a little idea of what the data looks like. So how do you measure this? Now, this is probably not what Vera Rubin was seeing. I suspect I couldn't really find a good example of that, that, that basically what they have is they have an image and they have a slit and the slit passes across the image and they get a spectrum of each point on the uh, image. Now you're looking at a galaxy, hopefully edge on, because if you're looking at it face on, you're not gonna be able to measure those velocities. So this is a little bit more modern image and you see the observed galaxy on the left. In the middle is the velocities uh, seen kind of edge on. And so you see the red shift on the the right and the blue shift on the left. So based on those uh, uh, spectrographic uh, data, you can calculate the velocities at different points in the galaxy and how fast it's rotating. The, the uh, right-hand image is the, is the velocity dispersion curve. It's basically how fast uh, stars are moving kind of within the galaxy. This uh, instrument is kind of interesting. Um, it's actually a, a, a fiber bundle. And so each fiber has its, is its basically its own spectrograph. And so you can get all of that data uh, from a two-dimensional image uh, very quickly. All right, so what, what do you end up with? So I, 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 if you were here last time, you've seen this graph uh, before. Um, the, uh, the upper graph shows uh, the curve the, the, the A curve there is the velocity of stars and gas clouds uh, that you actually that are actually measured. Now the yellow uh, dots are basically optical uh, measures. Uh, they could be infrared, but they're in the optical basic spectrum. And the blue dots are radio astronomy data. And the reason for that is that you know as you get as you're within the galaxy, you can you can see stars. But as you get farther out, you're basically looking at gas clouds. And so you really need radio astronomy for that. But, but it does all kind of fit on a curve. And the curve is this kind of flattened out curve as you go outwards. The B curve is what you would calculate the velocities to be based on Kepler's second law if the mass is concentrated where you see the, the, the bright images. Uh, so just as the, we would calculate in the solar system if the mass was concentrated toward the center. So, so it doesn't fit. And so that is the basis for the idea that, well, there's got to be something there that we can't see that has a gravitational attraction. Right? Uh, the artist's impression at the bottom comes from the uh, European Southern Observatory. And that's uh, that blue, hay, blue haze is what they think the, the dark matter distribution ought to look like. Oh, that, that one curve was from M33, by the way. So what is dark matter? So you can define it, it's pretty easy. It's something that has mass, that interacts with gravity, with visible matter, but it's not itself visible in the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, that's, that's an easy definition. The hard question is, well, what actually is it? <laughs> and, and there are candidates for it, but we really don't know what it is. And as, as you remember from Dr. Clevenson's talk, uh, one, one possibility is it's baryonic massive objects. That is regular matter, but matter that's dark so you can't see it. Things like rocky planets that are rogue planets or black holes. There's a lot of, in, of data and argument that there's not enough of that. There can't be enough of that to, to actually be these so-called machos. <laughs> so that leaves non-baryonic hypothetical particles. And you see some of the names for them there, um, the, such as the weakly interactive massive particles or WIMPs. So they go well with machos, machos and WIMPs. Um, but these are all hypothetical and the subject of... Um, debate and study. All right, so that's, that's all the science I'm gonna talk about. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, history and role of women in astronomy. I found this really neat um, website that uh, is eight women, in eight women astronomers you should know. Well, they included one uh, mythical one, but uh, the ones I'd like to point out are Carolyn Herschel, 
who was um, William Herschel's uh, sister. And she did actually did a lot of the work that he is credited with. <laughs> um, and she was interested in comets. She did a lot of comet observations. Uh, Henrietta uh, Leavitt, um, she was one of the Harvard computers. There were a lot of them that uh, Pickering hired to do his calculations, but uh, some of them became real astronomers in their own right, such as uh, uh, the one um, who's responsible for the Hirschsprung-Russell uh, sequence. Um, Henrietta Leavitt was uh, the one who basically discovered the um, uh, period luminosity uh, relationship for Cepheid variables. And uh, that really allowed astronomers to calculate distances much, much farther than they could do with the parallax methods that they had. Um, Sarah Seeger, who is at the bottom uh, left, um, was the first is credited with the first observation of an exoplanet, and then the, the other one up in the top row, the second in the top row, is Andrea Gaius, who got the Nobel, shared the Nobel Prize for evidence of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so some very famous astronomers, some modern, some uh, older. Uh, and then the last slide, uh, in terms of uh, the popular idea of women in astronomy, uh, I wanted to show some idea, some, some examples of uh, women astronomers in science fiction. The uh, first one on the left is actually a uh, novel with a woman astronomer character as the main character, but written by a woman astronomer as well. Um, the second one is uh, by Amy Brill, uh, is another one. Uh, the character is Hannah, who is an astronomer. Uh, and this novel was inspired by the life of Martha Mitchell, who was the first woman astronomer to uh, professional astronomer in America. Uh, she discovered this comet known as Miss Mitchell's Comet and got a, an award from the King of Denmark for it. <laughs> the last two are, are, are from a science fiction author that, that I like to read, uh, Brandon Morris. He uh, classes himself as a hard science fiction writer because his science fiction really is not all kind of like um, uh, warp drives and so on, stuff that you really can believe. Uh, and he does have um, several novels in which characters are, are women, uh, the astronomer characters are women. Um, and you can see some information about that. Uh, this last one, the disturbance, uh, they're trying to look back to the origin of the universe uh, using the sun as a gravitational lens, which is kind of an interesting idea. <laughs> so uh, I'll end with that, and I'll just say that uh, I think that I would like to encourage women and girls to think about astronomy as a career, and I, I think it's much much better environment now than it was when Vera Rubin was coming up. And as an example of that, uh, uh, my partner here, Bi Hung, uh, acquired uh, Dr. Clevenson's little book, Sky Puppies, and we sent it to my granddaughter, and we'll see what happens. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Jerry. By the way, astronomy, we were looking for majors for our kids, was the one major that had 100% placement. I don't know how, but if you were looking for things for kids to uh, major in, they had 100% placement as astronomy majors. Okay, so we are out of time, so we're gonna skip this one. Sorry, Brandon, we're not gonna do this one tonight. But if you were at the UH Clear Lakes uh, Star Party, we'll do this later. These are, we looked at, what am I doing? This is the one we already did. Okay, we um, looked at a bunch of double stars, and these are pictures of them. We'll talk about that in another meeting, and Brandon's going to tell us about the HR diagram, but we are out of time, so we got to do some other things. Okay, so David with Star Party News. Come on, David. Quick. At the star party on um, uh, UH Clear Lake. I've got some pictures of it, kindly provided by by Reed and, and Doug. Uh, 14th through the 20th was TSP. I didn't go. Anybody here who did? How was it? 
<laughs> weather? Wow. Okay. All right. Well, coming up in June, since we are now in June, June 24th, we have a Saturday night. We've got a, a Hack Wine out, Outreach event. July 22nd, this is in progress. So do not take this as, uh, that's why there's a question mark after it. Whether the, a star party to help the United States or U.S. Uh, space school uh, thing, the, the, the Italian gentleman, Francesco, came in and talked at the last meeting. They might need a star party. So it's kind of in flux. I'm going to let create a lecture. I'm going to let Chris and uh, uh, Angie and Francesco figure it out. If JSCS is involved, great. If not, no spilled milk is whether or not it's the star party is going to be held here, um, Dan's place in League City, or whether I heard UHCL in the behind the scenes. So it's just a question of where. So I'll facilitate the introductions and get that going. We'll see how that we'll see how it works. So just keep your ears, ears peeled. Um, August 26th, also on a Saturday, we got Hack Winery again. And September 8th through the 16th is Oki Tex. And there's something in there. Okay, um, Evelyn Metter Library has asked us for an event. They say their calendars actually are now closed. We're looking at August. Uh, I'm trying to get them to do what they did pre-pandemic, and it worked out surprisingly well, is to go ahead and have it midweek from 9 to 10. You have dinner, you pull out your scope, you're there for an hour, you, you, you buzz home. It's better than always trying to fry, carve out a Friday night or a uh, Saturday night. Now, because it's in the summer, I am pressing them to please keep the moon in play. So we have something, we've got a, a, a decent object in urban skies to work with. And UH Clear Lake Star Party, Reed, Doug, if you want to co-narrate these, that's that, that's fine. Looks like uh, uh, Bob Eaton and Reed with, with, with Reed Scope. Looked like a good time for all. Possibly the kids looked like they were having a good time since they like posing for pictures. Um, I didn't get a body count on how many came through. 20, 30, 20, 30 kids. Uh, I'm going to do this again. That's fine. Let's, let's, I'd be more than happy to, to, to help out here. And yeah, I'm going to let you read that one rather than my thought. All righty, thank you, David. Thank you for being our star party chairman. Okay, door prizes. All righty, can I do this out my glasses? First number, 905. All right, Chris Randall. Okay. On his DVD. Okay. Okay. Here's what we got, Chris. This is pretty cool. I've got a um, I've got a decal you can put on your vehicle. It says, God Astronomy. You like got milk? You're shaking your head at my door prizes. We got a moon map provided by David, a lamb so you can get all wet. I have a CST-100 Starliner mouse pad. Hold on. Got a book from Craig called The Milky Way, 5th edition. I don't know what that's about. And I have a book from uh, Mark, The Glow in the Dark Night Sky book. Okay, that's a brand new one from tonight. Mark DeCellis brought that one. Thank you, Mark. Oh, wait a minute. I almost forgot. Brought some ZWO um, keychains. I almost forgot. See, did you want a keychain instead? Okay, ZWO keychain. So I'll, I'll let the next one get that. Okay, 922. 922. Okay, come on down here. Okay, I have a ZWO keychain. Is this the first time you've been here? No. Okay, okay. ZWO keychain. What's your name? Huh? Tom. Tom. Hey, Tom. ZW Keychain Starliner mouse pad. A decal for your car says Got Astronomy. A moon map. <laughs> you don't like any of this stuff, do you? <laughs> moon map. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. One more. One more. Yeah. 
man, I tell you, the disappointed look on people's faces when they come down here is <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Um, nine one two. Nine one two. We used to have a bag of money in that that thing. Really, it was actually the club. And is it you? Come on, Bob. Let me see. If I can find something better for you. This is, this is what we got. We got a ZWO keychain, a book called The Milky Way, a Got Astronomy decal for your... You want that? All right. Thank you. Somebody took my decal. Thank you. Got Astronomy question mark. Okay, guys. Great. Everybody, uh, next month, July 14th, we're going to be here again at the LPI. It's going to be Dr. David Kring, uh, The Astrogeology of the Artemis Exploration Zone. So see you at Mod Pizza directly after our meeting. And we made it before 9.30. Woohoo!